we're doing is talking about functions and some different vocabulary associated with them. So we had started yesterday this problem. Remember, it was an absolute value. So it was a V. And it v from the point negative 2, negative 1. Remember that from last time? And we talked about the fact it was continuous because just in like everyday vocabulary, continuous means I can draw it without lifting my pencil, right? And I can't, I can trace the thing without lifting my pencil. Um, increasing or decreasing, we discussed the fact that that's left to right movement. And as we go left to right, my pen goes down and then it goes up. So this particular function is decreasing on a certain interval and then increasing on another interval. Some of them are only increasing, some of them are only decreasing. This one is a little bit of both. Then we talked about boundedness. Boundedness is a vertical thing. You have ceilings and floors. This particular, upper bounds are ceilings, lower bounds are floors. So this particular curve has no ceiling, so it is not bounded above but it is bounded below because there's a point beyond which it doesn't go any lower. So it's bounded below. Now, asymptotes. Asymptotes are curves, or excuse me, lines that the curve approaches but doesn't intersect. Does this picture have an asymptote? No, it doesn't have one. Now we're gonna look at some curves that do or some pictures that do. This one does not have an asymptote. Um, your exponential function, is, which is one of the ones we'll study, it has an asymptote. Because as you go off the page to the left, it keeps getting closer and closer and closer to the negative x-axis, but it never touches it or goes below it. So that's like a boundary, a lower bound there that actually is an asymptote. Our picture does not have one. Does our picture have a maximum or a minimum or both? It has a minimum. Minimum just means low point, right? So it has a minimum at negative 2, negative 1. That's its minimum point. Does it have a maximum? No, because it doesn't have a highest point. Um, Reed, did you have a question? I was just saying, so it's only an asymptote. When the well, it doesn't have to be the x-axis. When the curve approaches it but doesn't intersect it, that's an asymptote. Okay. So as you go, it gets closer and closer. It's as you head off the page. So if I head off the page to the left, for this one, I get closer. If I have one that looked like this, as I go up, I get closer, and as I head out to the right, I get closer. Uh, is that the only way it could be an asymptote? It's an asymptote and go to the right. Asymptotes can be anywhere. You can have an asymptote out here. It's it's anything that's confining the curve, that's holding the curve in, and it goes off the page. Um, all right, now symmetry. Do you have an idea what symmetry is? If you're symmetric to something, that means it's identical on both sides, right? So. When you studied parabolas last year, you talked about their line of symmetry or their axis of symmetry. Because if you folded the parabola, it would just double back right over on top of itself. So there are special symmetries, and that's what those notes are about. This curve, this thick guy right here, does not have any of the special symmetries. We're gonna talk about those. This curve, however, does have asymmetry. It is symmetric about something. Can you tell me what it's symmetric about? Does it have a line of symmetry? Mm -hmm. It does, doesn't it? But that line of symmetry is not one of our special lines, like the x-axis or the y-axis. What is the equation of that line of symmetry? X equals, negative. X equals negative two, very good. So this thing has symmetry about the line X equals negative two. So you could say it has a line of symmetry at X equals negative two. 
Well, you can say it's symmetric about the line x equals negative 2. Let's go ahead and finish. We got a couple more. Domain. Now, we need to talk a minute about domain. Uh, tell me what domain is. What do you think domain is? What does domain mean to you? It's related to the x's, right? So when you, remember, what was our definition of function? A set of ordered pairs where no x is repeated, right? So it's a set of ordered pairs. Ordered pairs have x values. The domain is all of those x values put together. That's the domain. There are really only, okay, let me back up. Most functions are going to have all real numbers as their domain. This function, x, can be anything. This domain is the set of all real numbers. That's the symbol. You can write all real numbers. You can say all reals. I don't care what, what you write. Most functions have all real numbers as the domain. When is the domain not all real numbers? Well, there are two main times. You have to be on the lookout for this. It's not an issue in this problem. But if you have a fraction, the denominator cannot be zero. So if your function involves a fraction, you have to make sure that you don't pick any x's that make the denominator zero. It's not, a, it got, not didn't apply to this problem, but I want you to write that down so you remember it. We're going to spend some time with that. Okay? So the first thing you look out for, Chase, can you put your mask on, please? The first thing you have to look out for is denominator cannot be zero. So whatever x's you pick for your domain cannot make the denominator zero. Okay, so if we had something like this, that's a fraction. You could not have x equal to 3, because if x were 3, your denominator would be 0, right? So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. The other big red flag for domain, there's really only two huge red flags. One is denominator cannot be 0. The other one is radicand must be greater than or equal to 0. Now, do you may know what I mean by radicand? What's the radicand? The radicand is the thing under a radical. So if you have a radical, this is called the radicand. And so if you have a radical in your problem, and you can have a radical in the problem, whatever is underneath it must be positive. Does that make sense to you? What happens if it's not positive? You get imaginary. And we're all about being real here. We're about graphing these things. So we need it to stay real. So, basically, and there are a few exceptions that we'll talk about, I mean, like pretty common exceptions, but basically, if you don't have a denominator and you don't have a radical, then you really don't have any domain things to worry about. I said there are a couple of exceptions. We'll deal with them. But just in general, that's what you have to be on the lookout for. A denominator and a radical. So what is the domain of this function? All real numbers. I can let x be anything. Could I plot a point out here? Yep. Could I plot a point out here? Yep. Out here? Yep. Anywhere. I can plot a point anywhere. Now, what about your range? Now that's a little harder, for me anyway. Range, I rely on my picture. Range is the y's, right? Tell me about those y's. Negative one, yep, not zero, negative one. And if you think about it, we have kind of already answered that question because when we said it was bounded below, what did we say? It was bounded below at negative one? What does that mean? That means it doesn't go lower than 
negative one, which means there aren't any y's less than negative one. So when you look at your boundedness, that will help you with your range because they both deal with vertical. Okay? And then what's the last one? Zeros. What are zeros? We kind of already talked about this because it's a word on our calculator. What are we looking for when we look for the zeros? Where we cross the x-axis, right? Now, there's two of them in this problem. Now, I did not do a very accurate sketch, but my picture looks like they are at negative 1 and negative 3. That's what my picture looks like. If I put in negative 1 here, do I get 0? If I put in negative 3, do I get 0? Yeah. So from my picture, which wasn't very good, I can't really rely on it totally, the zeros are negative 1 and negative 3. I can also find the zeros by simply setting my equation equal to 0. And that says the absolute value of x plus 2 equals 1. And then you graph that any way you want. You know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a dot at negative 2 and count forward 1 and backward 1. And there are my zeros. But you can solve that other ways if you want to. Zeros are the x values that make the function equal 0. Set your function equal to 0, and that's how you'll find the zeros. Now, um, before we do that supplementary sheet, let's do one more problem like that. There's another curve here, and let's run down through all that vocabulary, and I think we can make quick work of this. But let's see how we do. Let's get a picture first. Anybody have an idea what this looks like? It's Probably know, but that's a little bit tricky. What shape is that going to have? Do you know? Yeah. It's going to be a parabola because x squares, x squares are parabolas. Okay? Now, this parabola has a negative out in front of it. Do you happen to remember from last year, what did you say, Grace? It goes up and down. It turns it upside down. So this is an upside-down parabola. So a normal upside-down parabola would just look like this, right? But this one has a 3 in it. And don't be confused. Isn't that the same as this? So we have taken that upside-down parabola and added 3. Do you remember what that does? What? Up three. That's exactly right. So this parabola, and again, kids, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about these transformations. That's what we call all these movements. So don't panic. I think it's great that you remember that it's a parabola up here like this. So that's the point of zero three. So let's see how we do with the question. Would you say this is continuous? Yes, it is continuous. You can draw the whole thing or trace over the whole thing without lifting your pencil. There aren't any holes in it, there aren't any breaks in it. Nicely continuous function. Increasing or decreasing? Both. Now remember, we're moving left to right. So as we move, start at the beginning over here. As you move to the right, my pencil goes to the right, it's going up, 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 up until it gets to this point, right? So it is increasing on the interval from negative infinity to zero. Remember, we're talking about x's. As we go left to right, my pencil is going up. That's increasing. Then it is decreasing from here on. 
So again, I'm looking at x values. So from zero to infinity, it is decreasing. Read. I'm looking at x values. And as I'm moving in this direction, I'm not heading toward negative infinity. I'm looking at the x values going this way. Oh. All right, would you say it's bounded above, bounded below, and bounded in general? Is it any of those things? Bounded above. It is definitely bounded above at y equals 3. That's like the ceiling. Does it have any asymptotes? No, it just keeps going. It's it's not. Nothing hems it in. It just keeps going. Does it have a maximum or a minimum? Maximum. It has a maximum at the point zero three, right? Does it have any symmetry? This one actually has one of the special symmetries because what's its line of symmetry? Isn't it the y-axis? So this has symmetry. Its symmetry is about the y-axis. I want to talk about that more in just a minute. How about domain? Now remember, what did I tell you? Does this have a denominator? Does this have a radical? So what's its domain? 99% of the time, its domain is going to be all real numbers. What about its range? Exactly. If you are bounded above, if you're bounded above at y equals 3, then that means all of your y values are 3 or less. So y is less than or equal to 3. Or if you want to be really good, they'll say negative infinity to 3. That's the way a calculus student would write it. And what about zeros? According to my picture, there are a couple of them, right? I have no idea from that picture, no idea where they are. So I'm going to take my equation, which was 3 minus x squared, and I'm going to set it equal to 0, because that's what zeros are. Values of the function, or values of x that make the function 0. So what happens when I solve that? 3 equals x squared and x equals plus or minus root 3. So my zeros are at root 3 and negative root 3. Jacob? So if it looked like 0, then it would equal to the line to like Okay, wait, I'm not understanding the question. So, like, let's say it wasn't greater than or equal to, so if there was no line on either zero or negative sign, like, would the, would the line on the graph change at all? No, what would happen, that, that, would, that would never happen with a maximum at that point. Of course, that point's going to be included. But if you had some kind of a curve that was approaching asymptote of y equals 3 like that, then it wouldn't be included, but that, that doesn't impact the graph. Oh no, like what the line would change. No, okay. that's not going to change. No. Okay, so let's spend a moment, good job with that, let's spend a moment talking about these special kinds of symmetries and how we test for them. So, uh, Hayden, we're on our supplemental notes 1.2 that talk about different kinds of symmetries. So first thing I want you to understand is when we say special symmetries, what we're talking about are some very specific ones. So the special symmetries, we just had one. What was this one? This one was symmetric about what? Yeah. Y-axis, so that's one of your special ones. So Y-axis symmetry. Obviously, if the y-axis is a special symmetry, so is the x-axis. That's another one. There's four. y-axis, x-axis. 
You got blank there, let's come in. Anybody know if we can well guess what the other two are? The origin, that's a very special point. The origin, and then the line y equals x, which is called the identity function. And it is that perfect diagonal to quadrants one and three. So like a 45 degree angle there. That's called the identity line. And that is another one of our special symmetries. Okay? So find the special symmetries for y equals 3x. So I'm going to go through this and show you all the tests. Okay? So we're going to test for x-axis. And the order we do this doesn't matter. I'm just doing it in the order I think of it. Okay? Now, if we are testing for symmetry about the x-axis, we change the sign on y and see if we end up with the same equation. Now, before you even think about getting confused by that, I want you to stop and think about a picture that would have symmetry about the x-axis. Doesn't that picture have symmetry about the x-axis? Okay, so let's say this is the point, totally making this up, but let's say this is the point five, two. What would this point be right here? Five, negative two. So in other words, the sign on y can change without impacting the x, right? without impacting the equation. So I'm gonna take this equation and I'm gonna change the sign on y. That just means make it negative. And then I'm gonna stand back and I'm gonna look at the original and I'm gonna look at this new thing I got. Are they exactly the same equation? No. So this one does not have x-axis symmetry. That equation does not. If you have the symmetry you're testing for, the new equation that you get will match the original. It does. All right? Y-axis symmetry. Take a wild guess. How am I going to get y-axis? How am I going to test for y-axis symmetry? Change the sign on x. So y equals 3 times negative x. Is that the same as the original? No. This equation does not have those symmetries. Now I'm going to jump down to origin because the origin is changed to sign on both. X and Y. So if I do that, I'll have negative Y equals 3 times negative x. Now wait a minute, clean that up a little bit. Is that ultimately going to be the same as the original? Negative y equals negative 3x. Can I divide out the negative? Can I end up with exactly the same equation? So this thing, this line, the direct variation line, it has symmetry about the origin. In other words, whatever's happening in quadrant one is happening in quadrant three. To test for symmetry about the identity line, you switch X and Y. So instead of Y equals three X, it will be X equals three Y. Remember that the line, of, of the identity line is y equals x, so you switch them. Is that the same exact equation as the original? No. So the only symmetry this one has is symmetry about the origin. I want to be clear, most functions don't have any of these, really. Like a, if you found a random function in the hallway, it probably would not have any of these symmetries. 
So don't be alarmed when you get a whole bunch of no's. All right, let's try the next one. Y equals GX plus two. Tell me what you think. Spend a minute going through it. You don't need my help. You know what the tests are. I'll leave them written up here. See if you can get any of these new equations. Oops, that we make these changes. See if you can get any of these new equations to match the original. What do you think? Any brave soul want to throw an idea out there? Who? Like for all of them? For any of them, yeah. Did you get any of them to match? No. No. This one has no special symmetry. And this two right here that added on, I don't want you to think these are the same because if you divide out the negative like we did last time, you would have y equals 3x minus 2, which is not the same as the original. So this one has no symmetry, none of the special symmetries, no special symmetries at all. All right, so there's a bunch on here. Let's go ahead and try a few of them. Um, what about C? You don't even necessarily have to write everything down if you can just think in your head. If you change the sign on Y, that's not going to be the same, is it? Read. Oh, wait, I just asked one question. Uh -huh. um, so the origin, mm -hmm. is it okay if you have negative Y? You don't have to, your, the whole point is, you have to know if it matches the original or not. Okay. So, you don't have to do anything to it. Your, the question is, if I make this change, do I get the same equation? So as soon as you can make that determination, you're done. The answer is not this. This is not the answer. The answer is yes or no. Are the origins like yes or no questions? All these are yes or no questions. Am I symmetric about the x-axis? Yes or no? Am I symmetric about the y-axis? Yes or no? This is how you figure out if it's yes or no, but ultimately the answer is yes or no. Okay? Um, yeah, Liz? Okay, well let's finish this problem. Did you find any symmetries for this problem? Oh, it has one. It definitely has one. What happens if you change the sign on X? Isn't that going to be the same as the original? I didn't change the sign on X squared. I changed the sign on X. So that means negative X squared. So that one has y-axis symmetry. It does not have any of the others because as Liz pointed out, if I switch these, clearly that's a different equation. And if I change both signs, I'm gonna be left with a negative here that's not in the original. So the only symmetry this one has is y-axis. That one has y-axis symmetry. Um, let's look at F, Liz. Turn over the page. Let's look at F. Now, I did stipulate this equation is not a function. Okay? 
but we can still talk about symmetries, but it's not a function. So let's look at the equation, x squared plus y squared equals 4. I think this equation has every single one of these symmetries. Because if you change the sign on y, won't it just get squared out? If you change the sign on x, it'll get squared out. If you change both, they both get squared out. And Liz, when I switch x and y, don't I end up with exactly the same equation? So it has symmetry about the identity line also. What shape is this circle centered at the origin with a radius of two? So if you just think about that shape, it is not a function. I know it's not a function, but if you just think about that shape, isn't it symmetric about the y-axis? and the x-axis, and the identity line, and the origin, it has all the symmetry. So there's an example. Actually, there are more of those than you would think. It's, it's really quite remarkable. When we uh, get to a later section, we'll talk about inverses of functions, and they are always symmetric about that, I mean, with each other, the reflections across, so, yeah. Um, Let's do one more. Let's do uh, g. That's an interesting function. Does it have, take a minute and see if you can figure out if it has any of these symmetries. So y equals negative 1 over x. Does it have any of these symmetries? Find one yet? Josh? Uh, origin. Origin. Josh says it has symmetry about the origin because if we change the sign on both the x and the y, ultimately we end up with three negatives in there, right? Mm -hmm. Two of them will cancel and leave me with one, which is what was in the original problem. I agree 100%. Anybody else find another one? I think there's another one. Hector? Yeah, the identity line. If you switch the variables, don't be fooled. That looks different, but look what happens. If I multiply by y and then divide by x, don't I get exactly the same equation? So it, it, it isn't enough. This goes back to what Reed was asking about before. Sometimes you can just tell, you know, when you do it, you can say, oh, yeah, it matches. But it, it, sometimes you have to do a little work to really know if it matches or not. So this one has two symmetries. It has this one and this one. Okay, so do you have an understanding, sort of, about how to test for the special symmetries? Okay. So then we can go back to our notes and talk about the next thing, which is two new vocabulary words, even or odd. Now, I know you all have a sense of what even and odd means, but in terms of functions, an even function is a function that is symmetric about the y-axis. So an even function is symmetric about the y-axis. So if somebody hands you a function and says, is it even? You're going to do this test of symmetry only. And if it works, then the answer is yes. If it doesn't work, then the answer is no. 
even and odd functions have some special characteristics, um, and that's why they're kind of singled out. Um, the, the, the example we will probably use the most is with the sine and the cosine, because the cosine is even, and when we start graphing it, you'll see why, and the sine is odd. And that has implications when we, when we graph on it. But anyhow, when somebody wants to know is a function even, you do your y-axis symmetry test, okay? Even means symmetric about the y-axis. Odd means symmetric about the origin. And I always remember that because what does odd start with and what does origin start with? So odd means you are symmetric about the origin. So again, if the question is, is this function odd? All you'll do is change the sign on both and see if they match. Even, y-axis, odd, origin. This is good stuff. All right, let's look at the next section, which asks me about domain. Now, we, we did two examples today where we talked about domain, and both of them had all real numbers as the domain. Can somebody remember what I said about that? I know I'm giving you a lot of information today, but does anybody remember what I said? Why? Why did both of our problems have all real numbers as their domain? Oh, yeah. Because because we can uh, plot it and we would just know, like, the Yeah, so from the graph, we could tell it from the graph. But I, I gave you a little bit of information about the equations. Were you listening, Brenda? Oh, the one over here for the denominator? Yeah. So, first of all, you can't ever be zero in the denominator. So if a function has a denominator, you need to be on high alert. Your little domain antenna need to be up if your function has a denominator. Does this function have a denominator? No. So I'm not worried about that. What's the other thing I told you to be on the lookout for? Is there a radical? Because if there is, you've got to be positive underneath it. Does this have a radical? No. So its domain is going to be all real numbers. There are two things that mess up your domain, a radical and a fraction. Okay? I don't have them. I'm not worried. Look at the next one now. What does the next one have? A fraction. Right? What do we know about fractions? Denominator, denominator cannot be zero. So x minus three cannot be zero. Which means that x, because domain is all about x, x cannot be three. So your domain is everything from negative infinity to three, and from three to positive infinity. This is negative infinity to infinity. That's the whole shebang. That's everything. This is everything except three. So by putting these parentheses here, see that leaves three out, doesn't it? So that's your domain. Everything from negative infinity up to three and everything from three to positive infinity. Everything except three. All right, now look at this next one. Now, it has two fractions, okay? That means there's two things that x can't be. x can't be zero, and x can't be three. Okay, now, you're gonna write that as an interval. You can write that I mean, you might be able to just do it. I like to look at a number line. It can't be zero and it can't be three. 
So I'm going to go from negative infinity down here and infinity down here. So I'm going to go from negative infinity to zero, right? And then I'm going to go from zero to three. And then I'm going to go from three to infinity. Read. Well, remember, the parentheses means not included. Okay. It can be everything up to zero. Every number all the way up to zero. But it can't be zero. So zero is not included. It's like an open dot on the number line. So I use a parentheses to show that that number is not included. If you did bracket with one and two, would that be the same thing? Oh, that's a great question, but the answer is no, because this means, this means literally everything from 1 to 2. Now here's 0 and here's 3. These numbers are part of your domain. Your domain does not have to be whole numbers. It's every number, you know, 1.1, 1 1.07, 1, 1, 1 point, da 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 so no. You want to use always, I'm drawing, you want to use whatever these are. They're going to be part of your answer. Jacob? So, on the graph, so I could get like a better uh -huh. of a, like price, but I'm kind of a little bit more confused about it because I guess there's like two separate lines. So okay, the, the problem is, and we haven't talked about this yet, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into it. There, when you tell me that x can't be 0 and x can't be 3, those are going to be vertical asymptotes in my picture. Your calculator does not have the capability of raising its pencil. So when I, when I put an asymptote here and here, I can draw whatever's happening over here, and then I can pick my pencil up and draw whatever's happening in here, and then pick my pencil up and draw over here. It can't. So when it draws this, it goes down. And then you, it looks like a line is in there, but it's not really. It's just that's the only way the calculator can deal with it. Okay? So it would be more accurate if we went when we have it. We're going to sketch it by hand. But when we start sketching it by hand and then we start really looking at the calculator, we'll see how that calculator is operating. But right now, let's just not, I, I don't want to talk about that yet. I want to get through this domain stuff. And then we'll, we'll definitely do that. But that's what's happening. You, you saw these two lines because those are the two asymptotes in the picture. Okay. All right, what's next? Oh, my lordy. Look at the next one. Look at the next one. Your job is to find the domain. I am not going to panic. I am going to think about my rules, my red flag rules. Okay, question says what's the domain? The domain says your denominator cannot be zero, right? So clearly x could not be what? Negative one. I'm going to do it on a number line here, just to kind of, because I'm going to have to write an interval later. So x can't be negative one. All right. Now, what about this? I want you to be really careful. Can x squared plus one? Do I have to worry about that ever being zero? No. 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 X squared plus one will never be zero. Unless x is imaginary, which we're not doing imaginary. So I don't really need to worry about that piece. This one tells me x can't be negative 1. All right, now what does the numerator tell me? Well, whatever is underneath the radical, we call it the radicand, has to be greater than or equal to 0. It has to be positive. So what does that tell me about x? Well, if I solve this, 
Does this say x is less than or equal to 4? Remember, when I divide by a negative, I have to switch my sign. Is that right? So I'm looking at x less than or equal to 4, but not negative 1. So I'm looking at all the x's less than or equal to 4, but I have to skip over negative 1, right? So what's that going to look like as an interval? So we're going to look here. We're going to go from negative infinity to negative 1. Right? And then what are we doing? We're going from negative 1 to 4. And we're actually including 4. That's your domain. Big problem. Scary problem. Try the next one on your own. See if you can figure out E on your own. See if you can come up with an answer like this. An interval. the bottom tell us? X cannot be 2. So whatever's happening, I have an open dot at 2. X can't be 2. What does the top tell me? X plus 3 has to be positive, which means X has to be bigger than or equal to negative 3. So you don't have to draw a number line, but it helps me. That's what that looks like. I'm bigger than or equal to negative 3, but I have to jump over 2. So what will that look like as an interval? You're starting here now. So bracket negative 3 to 2. And then 2 to infinity. Jacob? Whatever is under the radical must be positive. Numerators, we don't care about numerators, but if it's a radical, whatever's under it has to be positive. 